Oh, he's the shove it man. Oh, he's the shove it man. He's gonna shove it. He's gonna shove it man. All right, it's the hawk. Yeah, you all want to yell at me for not reviewing NWA TNA recently. Sometimes things just happen that are out of your control. You little bitch. We're all the way up to episode 57. And basically, this show really sucks. Way too many XECW guys now. Simon and Swinger are terrible. Joey Legend. Red Shirt Security. Eric Watts. Why are all of these people on the show so often? It was better before. <sighs> and then they decide to start the show with a strap match with Simon Diamond and Johnny Swinger and the gifted Glenn Gilberti. How is he gifted? All of these people are repulsive to me. This will of course be a tag team championship match against America's Most Wanted. This is going to be one of those weird strap matches where the wrestlers aren't actually strapped together. It's just a random weapon to use. Don West talks about how this is better than a normal strap match because their real talent will shine through because they aren't strapped together. Glenn Gilberti is cheating. Did you expect anything less? Diamond and Swinger get a two on the double team. Gilberti hits Harris with the strap once. What was the point? Diamond suplexes Harris back into the ring for a two. Harris eventually gets lucky and makes the tag to Storm. James Storm uses the DDT, but he can't use the strap because Johnny Swinger stops him. Storm's choked out of Harris and able to help him. I guess this referee is really strong. Storm eventually dodges a dive, which takes out Gilberti and Harris tags in. Harris with the nice full Nelson slam and a back body drop, which isn't as nice. And that's just my personal preference. The best bit of the match is Glenn Gilberti getting speared and whipped by both members of AMW. Somehow this match is still going. Diamond and Swinger hit a double flapjack. Storm gets rid of Diamond with a missile dropkick. Wow, that's a dumb move. Storm powerbombs Swinger, which causes his own partner to get the superplex. Just the two. In the end, Diamond is caught in the sharpshooter for literally two minutes, but he doesn't tap. In that time, Swinger takes out Storm, which distracts the ref. Swinger smashes Harris with a steel chair, but he can only get a two. The ref stops him from using a chair again, but somehow another one's here. Storm super kicks the chair into Swinger's face. AMW can't hit the death sentence as it's broken up by the Diamond Man. It doesn't matter, as moments later Storm hits a hangman's noose as Diamond's on Harris' shoulders. There's the three. The annoying group are bad losers, so they do a beatdown after the match. They also steal the tag belts. Great, so this storyline isn't over. In the back, Jerry Lynn has been refused entry to the building by Don Callis and the Red Shirt Security. Apparently Don Callis doesn't want his wrestlers doing anything extreme or violent. Lynn's hardly the most violent person on the show, it doesn't make any sense. There was more violence in the match we just saw. Jerry Lynn is sent home, I guess so we can spend more TV time on the red shirt security. Now we're here with 4X Division Geeks. Michael Shane says he's sure Michael's cousin within 5 seconds. Joey Matthews who looks like a tin of dog food. How is he getting a potential title shot? Danny Doring with a weird blonde Great Rule of China on his head. And Shark Boy who's interviewed by Norman Smiley before the match. This is the only bit of the entire interview segment which is acceptable, because it's funny. Smiley tells Sharkboy he's got to focus tonight, because tonight he's having a match against Shawn Michaels, cousin. Yeah, that's actually how he says it. So here we go, a four-way match. Michael Shane, Dog Food, Doring, and Dark Sharkboy. What a random X Division match this is. Two of these guys can't even be considered TNA guys. Shane spits on Doring, who sort of spinebusters him. This show is changing so much on a weekly basis. Sharkboy connects on two guys with a missile dropkick. He dodges dog food and snaps off a head scissors. He's the only man getting cheered here. Doring grabs Matthews by the nipples for some reason. How many matches can you say that Danny Doring has the size and weight advantage? This feels more like a tag match anyway. Doring takes out dog food with a pump kick and tags are made. Sharkboy throws a bunch of drop kicks. He does the big wiggle. Sharkboy's the only one here not trying to do 50 moves. He's just trying to be entertaining. Doring throws himself out of the ring. Michael Shane does the same thing, but better. And then the shark climbs to the top to take out Michael Shane to zero reaction. Probably because his dive was the worst of the three. We're back in the ring quickly. Sharkboy blocks the Frankensteiner and hits deep sea drop on Matthews. No pin is made because Doring takes him out. Doring connects with a deep panty leg drop or whatever he called that thing. Randomly Skipper interferes and takes out Doring with an alley-oop. No idea what that's about. Skipper takes out the two other guys as well. He screams it's my house and leaves the ring. He cuts a promo sulking that Jerry Lynn isn't here tonight, he wants to face him. He talks about how it's prime time and leaves. The match continues and Michael Shane quickly eliminates dog food and Doring with super kicks. Shark Boy is the final man but he blocks the super kick and hits a net breaker for a two. The shark's too busy dancing around again which turns out to be a bad choice because Shane hits him with a fisherman's DDT. 
Michael Shane is the number one contender. The match was no way near X Division standards. Eric Watts is in the back. He's talking about a man called Eric who's joining TNA soon. I feel like this has been going on for months. He threatens Vince Russo and says he won't be able to put his hands on him physically or sexually. In the ring, it's Shane Douglas. He's feuding with Raven. He brags about beating Raven last week. He says wrestling companies can't make it unless they hire a wrestler like Shane Douglas. This guy's completely deluded. That being said, he's not as bad as Swinger and Diamond, but this show has gotten so boring since all these guys showed up. He's not funny and he just drones on and on and on. Tonight, he will franchise Raven's ass. Instead of coming down the ramp, Raven appears behind him, so it's a coward gimmick. The advantage doesn't last long and the franchise boots him in the slash zone. Raven's down get beaten up for a bit before the super kick and the Raven effect shuts down Douglas. Some horrible audio starts playing, it's James Mitchell. Eventually video accompanies the audio. The new church have captured the gathering backstage. Bulldozer Brian Lee is threatening to set them on fire. Mitchell says that Raven could either finish off the franchise or save his friends. Don't forget to bring the marshmallows. Raven runs off to save his friends which Douglas finds hilarious. In the back is Larry Zabisco talking about beating up young disrespectful wrestlers. Tonight will be the end of Kid Cash. I like how they show the TNA cage dancers with a creepy young, creepy young man's face watching her. Kid Cash will now take on the living legend Larry Zabisco. He bows to the cage dancer. Zabisco does a weird dance. They both trade submissions. Kid Cash dumps in his nappy and takes a breather in the corner. Larry continues doing well with the arm ringers. That is until Cash does the double spring into the crossbody. Cash is unhappy with the referee's count, so he slaps the ref, who slaps him back. Larry stops Kid Cash with a nut claw. Zabisco looks for a backbreaker now, but the big scary dude rushes the ring. He flattens Cash by mistake. This distracts the referee, so Abisk and Black Hole slams Zabisco. That is the three. So far, this show belongs in the turd zone. Raven can't find Mitchell in the new church. He smashes a chair against the fake wall in anger. We cut back to the ring where somehow James, Mitchell and the new church have taken the gathering. It's not a big arena, how the hell did Raven miss them? Mitchell says that Julio and Alexis are about to feel some real pain. Raven rushes the ring, I'm glad he's finally found them. He takes out the new church on his own. Remember when these guys used to be a threat? He tries to DDT Mitchell when franchise Shane Douglas appears and hits Raven with the belly to belly. Now they all beat him up thanks to their hero Shane Douglas. Somehow Julio escapes but the bulldozer boots him down. They put Raven in a body bag and slowly boot him. Not sure what the point was. Yay, Mad Mikey is back. This was the highlight of the show last time. Basically, it's these wacky skits of Crash Holly being angry about things. He's too short to play basketball, so he beats a guy up to get a leg up. He beats up a receptionist for taking too long to serve him. His roommates drink his orange juice, and Mikey kills him and stuffs him in a fridge. Then he's beaten up by some girls at poolside. It's really weird, but it's great at the same time. Oh no, why are these guys back again? The gifted Glengo Bertie says they'll be waiting out back with the tag belts. Simon Diamond says they're the best tag team in wrestling. He's wrong, by the way. AMW jump them and they brawl against the fence, which looks like it might collapse. Now they're coming back to the arena. Why? They fight in the ring again. It's going okay until Glengo Bertie hits Storm and Harris with the tag belts. Yay, more whipping. We already had a strap match. We don't want to see this again. Some geeks stop them and the belts are given back. Now it's a very, very long video package explaining the feud between Kazarian and Saban. Basically, Saban has held onto his X Division title despite getting beaten up all the time. And now they must have another X Division title match. So once again, it's the battle of the future, Kaz vs the champion Chris Saban. Saban is supposed to be the heel, but I think the crowd prefer him. Kaz is in control in the early game with a drop kick and another drop kick in the corner, shade to Jeff Hardy. Saban realises he's losing and he German suplexes Kaz into the corner. Now it's a clothesline with acrobatics. Saban tries a big wind-up slam. Kaz sort of pins him from it, but it doesn't look great. Saban's in control for a while until Kaz counters with a kick. They fight outside the ring where Kaz slingshots off the apron into a DDT. He gets back in the ring. Saban looks like he's going for a moonsault, but he's too slow to do it, and Kaz gets him on his shoulders from the middle rope and hits the back to the future. How the hell is that just a two? It makes no sense. Kaz also gets stopped from diving as Saban springs to the top and throws him overhead. Also a two count. Then there's a ref bump. Saban smacks Kaz with the title belt. We literally saw people getting smacked with belts 10 minutes ago. That's how this match ends. Wait, no, a geek from the back says that the match needs to restart. Whilst it is a good call, you have to wonder why only sometimes people from the back notice people cheating. The referees are arguing. As soon as the match restarts, Kaz does the wave of the future, which is the free. 
but the referee throws a strop and takes the belt away. Borash says that the referee's going to the back to check with... with... big paws. And then he remembers that Eric Watts is the man who's supposed to be in control right now. I expected much better from that match. At Trailer Park, it's time for the free live crew. This is apparently the home of Mold Dog. I guess all that WWE money didn't get him very far. Conad and Truth are here looking for him. A mechanic tells them where he is. I wonder what happened to Jamie Dundee. But I guess this guy is a villain or something because he's rubbing himself and pointing menacingly with a shoe. Wait, no, Mold Dog's in a river trying to catch fish. He has a tattoo on his belly which says, Dog. Why is that weird guy still watching them and rubbing himself? Mold Dog brings them to his trailer. Now Dog is teaching Truth how to rap and use a harmonica. Now Sweet Home Alabama starts playing. What the hell am I watching? What drugs did they take? It ends. I have no idea what to say. The fallen angel Christopher Daniels is in the crowd. I have no idea what he's talking about. Something about being against tradition and he doesn't like slap nuts. Join the squad. As Daniels talks, I find myself being more entertained by the little kid pulling funny faces behind him. Someone hit me with a brick. And that kid too. He says that he used to be traditional as a fat drunk woman is yelling at him. Daniel says he wasn't sure about joining Sports Entertainment Extreme, but Russo helped him see that wrestling was stagnating, so now he's all about change. This goes on for ages, such a strange character change. He starts singling out random people in the audience, trying to see if people are ready to embrace change. A random punk throws a drink at Daniel, so he attacks him. Then a wild slap nuts appears. Hey, Jeff Jarrett. Possibly his most low-key appearance of all time. Jarrett invites Daniels back out to face him whilst people are trying to construct a cage. Redshirt security who exist for some reason try to stop Jarrett. Now there's two different security teams in the ring. Who wants to see a feud between two security teams? Daniels appears in the ring which I barely noticed. He kicks Jarrett in the slash zone and hits a crossroads. America's Most Wanted are back again. Chris Harris says I know there's a lot of people in here who want to beat up Glenn Gilberti. He wants a six-man tag next week. Their partner is going to be Dusty Rhodes. AMW and Dusty Rhodes versus Swinger, Diamond and Gilberti. I have zero interest in ever seeing that match. Why do I have to watch this? Mike today has a sit-down interview of Russo and AJ Styles, who I keep forgetting is even the NWA Heavyweight Champion. Tanay asks why AJ would associate himself with Russo. His response is, why not? Isn't it pretty obvious when the man has the top belt? Mike today is upset because he thought AJ was his little friend. AJ is smaller than the two men on either side of him. Russo tells AJ he can go now. This was not a good interview. AJ came off as a little kid. Russo and today square up to each other as usual. Russo threatens him for a while. This show is so bad. And I believe all we have left is the main event. But first, Eric Watts is here with some handcuffs. It's a cage match with Dilo facing AJ Styles. Watts has handcuffs to chain Russo to him. It's a really good start to this one. As established, they have nice chemistry. Styles tries a springboard which is caught and Dilo hurls him into the cage. The vicious dropkick from AJ sends Dilo into the steel. Both guys have juice coming out their faces. Out of nowhere Dilo hits a Samoan drop which I guess I'm half okay with. Bunch of suplexes from Dilo now. Love it when he starts busting out the moves you wouldn't expect. AJ also tries the Styles clash which is reversed into the Alabama slam. And straight up he goes to hit the lowdown and I have no idea how that's just a two. Suddenly AJ powerbombs him out the corner and flawlessly turns it into a Styles clash. D'Lo kicks out too. Nice move from D'Lo now. He tackles AJ into the cage, straight into a sky high. And now it's a spine buster from D'Lo. This is such a one-sided match. D'Lo climbs to the very top of the cage, but he doesn't dive because he's distracted by Russo throwing powder into Watts' eyes. This causes Watts to slam Russo into the cage, which knocks D'Lo to the mat. AJ makes the cover, and that is the free. Such a weak ending. D'Lo's fall didn't even look that devastating. And the whole thing with having Russo handcuffed to Watts was a complete waste of time. Why do it if it's going to be that easy to cheat still? The match itself was okay, but the show overall sucks on Isiaki's ass. Speaking of which, where was he? Oh wait, here he is. Russo starts cutting a promo, but today screams that we've run out of time. Yeah, great show right here. For the second episode, I'm going to be switching over to my files because the Impact website adverts have slurred me down too much. Hence the downgrading quality. Don't like it, shut up or I'll smack you one. We open with Gangrel, Crowbar and Sin. Not three people you'd like to run into in a dark alley. Sin is, of course, the future Kazani. Wow, they'll be facing the Free Life crew. I can't believe they're actually having a match. Apparently, this team have been tearing it up on Explosion, the B show. I can't even comprehend that. Considering the three guys involved, you think they'd be on the main show. I don't think this one's going to last long. Conad does a face buster and a head scissors in the first minute. 
He tags in the mole dog, which he shouldn't have done as he gets distracted, which enables Crowbar to hit a northern lights. Crowbar assists Sin to hit a moonsault, quickly followed by a lion salt, quickly followed by a gangrel elbow. Somehow Road Dog kicks out of all of that. We get a double down and tags are made. Why are they showing the Harris brothers in the crowd? Hasn't there been enough annoying people on this show? Truth has the tag and does a scissors kick with a wacky dance beforehand. Now it's the splits, not into a kick because Conad hits a clothesline. The crew now hold Gangrel's legs so Truth can do a leg drop to the nutsack. Crowbar tries to dive on them but he's caught and Conad kicks the pile over. The crew do a bunch of sexual moves to Sin and the Mole Dog wins the pump handle. A pretty nice debut, this show started out better than the last one. Eric Watts is suddenly in the ring complaining about AJ Styles and Russo, he keeps calling Siaki acehole. Out come AJ and Russo, Russo says as long as we've got the belt we've got the stroke around here. Russo says that there's no more contenders for the belt so they're jetting off on holiday. Watts is left speechless by this. He eventually has a thought and stops Styles and Russo just before they leave. He says they have two choices, either get a hotel room together with a single bed and forfeit the title, or AJ Styles can fight low-key tonight. Low-key's name gets zero crowd reaction. Russo says they'll have to get back to him, but Styles ignores Russo and goes to the ring. AJ dares Eric Watts to take the belt from him. Before any fight can take place, Loki rushes the ring. Joey Legend stops him, but Watts quickly takes out Legend. Is it me or a Legend and Watts hard to tell apart? Watts is stopped by Russo of a bat. Slapnuts is also here and he easily beats up Team AJ. Loki does a rolling kick to clear AJ from the ring, and now he holds up the world title. The last time I remember seeing Loki in a match in TNA is when Jeff Jarrett beat all three members of Triple X on his own. So why should we think he has a chance? In the back, it's fucking Glenn Gilberti and his friends, the Lumps. Gilberti makes fun of Dusty Rhodes doing the elbow. Simon Diamond actually does a pretty good impression of Dusty Rhodes. This was the best thing this team have ever done. Here's Elix Skipper with his scale. He's jumped on the ramp by Jerry Lynn. I guess he's allowed in the building this week. Lynn gets him in the ring and nails a big reverse spinning elbow. His offense doesn't last and he's thrown from the ring. Skipper misses his moonsault off the apron. He tries to hit Lynn with a scale, which also misses. Skipper can't land to move. Lynn randomly elbows him to the mat. I think something went wrong as Lynn looks confused by this. Skipper hits a kick and now it's a beautiful spring up to the top rope into a moonsault. Just the two. Skipper puts Lynn on the top rope and he rope walks, but he misses. Not sure if it was a botch or not, but apparently he's calling that new school. We move on to a Jerry Lynn DDT hanging from the ropes and that is the three. Why did this have to be so short? It was going along nicely, although botchy, I was entertained. Skipper is a bad loser and he carries on the attack. Big belly to belly and then he misses his top rope leg drop. Lynn smashes him in the face with the scale. Jerry Lynn has snapped. Some geeks run out whilst Callis dumps his nappy of anger. Lynn is scared to confront Callis so he leaves in the opposite direction. So now there will be a ladder match to determine the number one contender. Frankie Kazarian versus Michael Shane. He's Shawn Michaels cousin by the way. Kaz quickly scurries up the ramp to retrieve the ladder. Bad decision because Michael Shane throws himself on top of the ladder on Kazarian. Shane continues dominating the ring, throwing Kaz into the ladder time and time again. He tries to squash Kaz, who dodges at the last second. Later, Shane tries a ladder shot, which is countered by Kaz springing off the ropes of a drop kick. Big back body drop into the ladder. Kaz isn't done and he jumps over the ladder with a leapfrog into a leg drop. This guy's always had a nice leg drop, I'm surprised he could still walk in 2023. Kaz climbs the ladder, but he's stopped. Shane hits him with a net breaker off the ladder. Insane move next, Kaz does a sunset flip powerbomb, it looked brutal. Kaz is about to win, and then out of nowhere Saban shoves the ladder over. I guess he's scared to face Kaz again. Wait, no, Shane's climbing the ladder when Saban drop kicks the ladder away. Saban climbs the ladder himself and steals the contract. He decks Kaz and Shane with the title. I have to admit, I like what they're doing here. I assume it's going to be a triple threat next. Don Callis takes Saban's belt away. This Saban attack goes on for a while. Yay, Mad Mikey is back. He starts by smashing his alarm clock. Now he's mad at Ben Affleck. He's run out of toilet paper, so he uses Ben Affleck's magazine. Suddenly the broadcast is interrupted and the crowd loudly boo. It cuts to the production truck where a nerd comes running out and screaming that Mad Mikey's here. He smashes the tape and has a temper tantrum like Christian. Really good episode of TNA so far. Slapnuts is now interviewed. He's sulking because he's not allowed any more title shots. Boo hoo. Now Kid Cash will take on beautiful Bobby Eaton. I'm not sure why. Cash won't start the match as he wants to talk. This is actually one of the last televised wrestling matches for beautiful Bobby. Cash insults wrestling legends. He says after watching all of the Midnight Express's matches, he just has one question. 
who was the conductor and who was the caboose? I have literally never heard that expression before. Cash drop kicks him sort of out of the ring. For some reason he then throws a chair in his face and isn't DQ'd. Ian does actually manage to get back in this match. Seemed like it was only going to last for a minute, but it goes longer. Ian even nearly beats him with a netbreaker, and again with a nice backbreaker. The big scary dude abyss is here, which allows Cash to kick him in the nutsack and get the free from the roll up. Worst thing on the show so far. In the back, the big twins are fighting again. Legend says when you mess with AJ, something something. I literally can't understand the end of what he says, he's too Canadian. You mess with AJ? Nah. You mess with the whole town council! Nah. You piece of garbage! Shane Douglas is here, so the show continues going downhill. He'll face Raven. Holy shit, the chair boy is back. Shane Brian Lawler's gone at this point. Shane Douglas attacks Raven in front of him. Basically, it's what you would expect from Raven and Douglas. Raven gets the advantage and he's about to win with the even flow when James Mission appears on the ramp with a body bag. He says Alexis is in the bag and she's about to suffocate. It doesn't matter anyway because Raven wins with a small package and he rushes up the ramp to the bag. But Alexis isn't in the bag. There's a blackout and a mystery man is in the bag and he's laid out Raven. They want to cut Raven's hair. The shearing is stopped by the security. They scream that Raven's loyalty has cost him. Well, he won the match, didn't he? Sonny, don't look at my ass. Yaki is cutting a promo in a tent or something. He threatens D'Lo Brown and says he's going to take his career because next week it'll be a burial of his career when they have a casket match. The production qualities of this promo were not acceptable in any way. A quick update from the cage dancers. There's a new one. She has curly blonde hair like the girl of Ozark. She won't make me bark. Don Callis is ranting about the X Division. He says he's come up with the best idea ever to solve the issues. He holds up a sketch of an Ultimate X match. Wow, really cool to see this for the first time. He explains the rules and he says the match will also pop a big buy rate. I get to sleep for a bit now because it's the six man strap match. I refuse to watch this apart from the ending. I'm sick of all of these morons. All you need to know is that Gilberti, Diamond and Swinger seem to have aligned themselves with Team AJ. Yeah, 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 yet another massive faction in TNA. Slap Nuts and Watts beat them all up together. Next week there'll be a double bull rope match with AMW and the Diamond Crew. I'm 100% certain I won't be watching that match. Legend and Daniels will also face Slapnuts and Joe E. Legend. I also don't want to see that one. What I do want to see though is this main event. AJ Styles vs Loki for the NWA Heavyweight title. There seems to be 16 minutes left of this show, so it's either going to be really good or a whole load of shenanigans at the end of the show. AJ Styles looks a bit intimidated from Loki's style. AJ Styles fights out of a submission and screams get up, but Loki is slow getting up. I think he's just being weird. Loki eventually gets up and he keeps striking Styles with authority. AJ Styles slows him down with a drop kick and a net breaker type move. Check this bit out as AJ tries to throw Loki out the ring, but he sort of 619s into him. Lovely. Loki keeps throwing the kicks at Styles. It leads to another beautiful exchange where AJ sweeps his legs. Loki kips up and hits a rolling kick. AJ keeps trying the Styles clash, which isn't working. He kicks Loki in the back of the head instead. AJ kips into a head scissors to send Loki out the ring. Off the ring apron now, it's the moonsault into the inverted DDT. AJ continues dominating in the ring of a double underhook suplex, enjoying this match. Loki tries for a dragon sleeper, which doesn't work, and AJ snaps him across the ropes of a head scissors. They're getting tired now, and here's the ref bump, just as Loki connects with a springboard kick. Not sure it needed a ref bump because nothing happens. It's Loki's turn to hit a double underhook into a pin, just a two. More kicks are thrown by Warrior for another two. AJ counters the key crush into a DDT and both men are down. They're only back to their feet for a second because Loki misses the kick and he's hit with a discus forearm. AJ Styles starts showing some intensity and fire now. He's going absolutely crazy with his strikes. AJ breaks out of Loki's submission attempt and hits a German straight into a face buster. He attempts another inverted DDT but this one is countered. Loki tries to put him away at the cartwheel kick but it sends AJ out the ring. On the outside, Russo tries to hit Loki with his bat, but Loki isn't having it and he beats Russo up on the table. Loki wants to dive Russo for a table, but the ref won't let him. AJ boinks Loki in the head with the bat, and that's how the match ends. They go off the air with Tanay screaming, Russo now has all the power. What about AJ Styles winning the match? Well, at least it was a great match. That second episode was much more tolerable in the whole, and if you don't agree with that, I'll leave you in the ground like a mole.